TV is here with Greg Raymer. Greg, thanks for being here today. Thanks, Lizzie. Glad so we're to be here. here. NBC heads up. You're about to go into your second match with Scott Clements. What do you know about Scott? I've played with Scott. Um, we were at the same table for a little while, not a long, long time, not all day or anything, but for a while during one of the preliminary events during the World Series last right. summer. And, uh, you know, so I've seen him play a little bit. But there's a big difference between, you know, full ring and heads up. Definitely. So it's not like I can say for sure what kind of adjustments he makes to his game for that. Well, what adjustments do you make to your game when you're playing heads up? Well, the big difference, I think, is, you know, when you're the small blind, you're also the button. So you get to act first pre-flop, and then you're going to be last on every other street. Um, I've adopted the strategy of every time I raise pre-flop on the button, I min-raise. Why is that? Because it gets the job done. I mean, what I've found now after trying this out a lot, mostly, you know, lots of practice games on Poker Stars playing heads up sit and goes, mm -hmm. the opponents will fold almost as often for a min raise as they will for like a, a typical three times the big bet raise. There's no need to risk that many chips in case they exactly. come over the top. If they come over the top and I'm going to fold, I lose less. If I have a premium hand and they're going to call, then yeah, I'm losing a little bit of value there. But uh, you know, most of the time you don't have, you're a, not premium have a premium hand. hand when so, you're heads up. Um, you know, in any even at a full table, most of the time when you bet, even if you only bet when you think you're ahead, you want your opponent to fold. I mean, more than half the time, I would say. So my general strategy in full ring games, tournaments, cash games, heads up, whatever is to better raise the minimum that I think will get the job done. That makes sense. And Absolutely. then I stick to that number all the time because I don't want them to see that I'm betting more or less when my hand is stronger or weaker or vice versa. How do you versa. think that affects your opponent if you're making the same raise every time? I think it disguises my hand completely. In other words, you know, is he making a move with a weak hand? Because um, it's not like I'm only going to wait for pairs and aces and stuff like that heads up. You know, I'm going to have to raise on the button with hands like Jack-10 suited and, and other playable hands that aren't super strong. So since I'm always raising the same amount and I think I'm doing it with the same body language, the same demeanor, mm -hmm. hopefully Scott and every other opponent I face is going to have no clue whether that's aces or suited connectors or something else. So what do you think will be the most effective style of play to employ against, against Scott in order to succeed? Well, I don't know Scott well enough, and I've never played him heads up. So as to what will work best against him, I'm going to have to figure that out as we go. But, uh, you know, I think generally the strategy of uh, playing kind of a, you might say like an unexploitable game theory optimal strategy. Mm -hmm. That's really the place to start with any opponent who you don't know well. Um, and so that's what my strategy is. That's what I've tried to develop in terms of preflop hand selection, um, you know, which hands I raise with, which hands I'll limp with, which hands I'll fold. And then also how I play and how much I bet after the flop. All of that is really based on setting it up so that if my opponent can't read me, he cannot beat me except through short-term luck. Um, so when you're playing online, you know, that's the goal because your opponent obviously can't read you. And in fact, online, I'll even like count to myself so that there's no timing tells. In other words, it's like the so same... So you'll make your bets or your calls at exactly the same time? Yeah, so when it's my turn to act... The only reason that you should see a difference in the tempo of my yes. decisions is because of lags in the internet connection. Really? So maybe you made a bet and it didn't register on my computer for two seconds. So I can't tell that that wasn't your two second delay. I think it's, you know, I think it's your delay, not the mm -hmm. computer delay or the internet delay. So maybe my bet comes seven seconds after yours instead of the typical five, you know, and actually it's a little quicker than five. It's probably more like a three count. But by having that steady tempo, you also get rid of the timing tells. Um, and then I'm going to be adopting that and did adopt that yesterday against Human that I try to have my pace be consistent every time so that it's always that same. And, and live, it is more like five or six seconds. What other techniques do you use to succeed online that you might not use playing live? Well, really not any. I mean, that's about it. You that's know, about you, it? You, you play an optimal strategy. And then live What's your or, optimal strategy? Well, the optimal strategy is having this, you know, if I'm going to raise, I'm in raise. Post-flop, I always bet half now, the pot. Now, is this only heads up or is this also heads in up. full tournament? No, this is heads up. So heads, okay. It won't work in a full ring because now, you know, if you, if you do a min raise, you might, have, you might have players behind you. And so not only will they call you more because it's cheaper, but they'll call you more because they have position. So you might have to bet more than a minimum raise in a full ring game to get them to fold as often. 
So maybe you'll get called twice as much with a min raise as you will with a three times bet in a, in a full ring game cash or tournament. So you have to adopt to your table. And in fact, if I'm playing my opponent heads up, if Scott is calling with any two cards when I min raise, then I might start raising more and make it 3x. And if that's not enough, then maybe you make it 4x. So you have to find the sweet spot. You've got to find what works for this person. But what I've tried to develop through my online practice is something that's approaching you know, game theory optimal, which just means you're unexploitable. So that if your opponent doesn't have some ability to read you like they might in a live context, that they cannot beat you. In other words, if they play optimal, you'll be 50 50. And if, if they, they do anything less than advantage. optimal, then you have the advantage. The only downside to game theory optimal play in any game, not just poker, but anything, is that you can be passing up opportunities to take maximum advantage of an opponent's mistakes. So if you're not playing optimal, then someone who can adjust to your mistakes and not play optimal themselves will win more money from you in a given period of time I than I would if I stay at just that optimal strategy and never change it. So that's really the big difference, both live and online, is that I'm going to start with this game theory optimal strategy to the best of my abilities, and then I'm going to use my skills to try and adapt it to start taking advantage of their mistakes. And does this also work in really large field tournaments online, say a tournament with one or 2,000 players? How do you adjust your game there? Well, in theory, it works for any game you can play of any sort. Mm -hmm. Just anything that you could even define as a game game theory works but games like poker and chess and, and other really complicated games so many situations yeah there's so many variables that no one is truly developed an optimal game theory perfect strategy you just can't do it the game is too complicated but you still start with that you know so i think if you know when i when i go to the first event of the world series you know the first like say fifteen hundred dollar no limit hold'em and i've got four thousand opponents i'm going to have a, a wide assortment of playing styles and skill levels at my starting table. But I'm still going to start off with a given opening raise if I'm the first guy to open the pot pre-flop. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to have a percentage of the pot that I'm going to bet every time after the flop. And I'm going to adjust that once I start figuring out the little foibles and tendencies of these eight or nine people you know, and who I'm against this pot. So then I'll start adjusting and you'll see me betting more or less. You'll see me you know, check raising more or less, you know, other, you know, in other words, I'll have to do different things differently to take advantage of their weaknesses. Um, and that's really, of course, the hard part. Yeah. Um, if you, and, if, and if you could figure out a game theory optimal strategy for poker, you could just stick to that the whole time and know that because most of your opponents are playing a lot less than optimal, you'd make a profit. But you still make a lot more money exploiting their mistakes. You know. Well, let's say you sit down at a table or you're seated at a table online. It's a big tournament, and there's someone at the table who's just very, very aggressive. How do you adjust your play to still succeed against a player like that? I tend to call a lot. Um, it depends, though. That's interesting. A lot a of players good, don't say that. A good aggressive opponent will know when to slow down. Mm -hmm. you know, they, as soon as they see you call, to them that's just as intimidating as a raise, maybe more intimidating. Especially if you have position. So... They might slow down, but you know a lot of guys, and this is probably, I don't know if this is more true online than live anymore. I mean, when I won the World Series, we considered the online players the fish, and the live, you know, the seasoned live players were the world's Solid best. Players. But now that dichotomy is kind of changing a bit, and the best players online are considered maybe the best all-around players, less so than the live they players. They a lot of hours. You know, when they're playing 10,000 hands a day, some of them, they, they tend to learn something. Um, and if they don't learn something, they go broke and go away. <laughs> so, so as you progress through a tournament, what adjustments do you have to make as the field gets smaller and smaller? The big adjustment is the size of your stack. Even if you are doing well and you have an above average stack, even the chip lead at your table, mm -hmm. as you go deeper in a tournament, you get fewer blinds in everybody's stack. So even if you always have double the average and more chips than anyone at your table, Early in the tournament, that might be 100 big blinds or 200 big blinds. Later on, just Later on now declines. you've got 40 and they've all got 20. And that changes things a lot because now more of the action is pre-flop. You can't, you know, like limp in with the 4-5 suited hoping to hit a big flop. So you have to tighten up your hand selection? Hand, hand selection tends to be tighter. You tend to have to be more aggressive. You almost never limp in if you're the first one in a pot later in a tournament. Whereas 
you know, level one of most No Limit Hold'em tournaments, I'm happy to limp when I'm in early position with suited connectors, baby pairs, suited aces. Yeah. Um, limping, See a flop. <laughs> yeah, limping is often a, you know, a correct decision, but it's seldom correct late. If the hand's worth playing at all, then just raise and hope that because you've got them covered, they're just going to give up unless they have a big hand. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming by today, Greg. All right. Thanks, Lizzie. Lizzie Harrison with Greg Raymer for Card Player TV.